Well, if you're thinking of sharing rental costs with a couple of roommates to save a few bucks, or you know of a young person wanting to do so, surprise, surprise, that cost has gone up. Devel Morrison, our real estate expert and regular contributor here, is back this week for another real estate check-in. Hey, Devel. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. So, Devel, I remember my first apartment in Hamilton, Ontario. The cost right. was $750 a month. I had a one bedroom, did not have to share any w- with anyone. I had a walk-in closet. I was on the 18th floor. It, it, it was a pretty good a pretty good deal. I loved it. But that's no longer the case for people wanting to rent. And many people have to bring in a roommate. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know what? I remember what... But- When I was in my my 20s, I had a bunch of friends who moved to New York City. And I guess I always looked to New York City because it it still is the city that's more expensive than Toronto. And I remember what my friends were doing. They would put up a sheet in the living room. And one month, one of them would have to sleep in the living room bedroom. And the next month, they would swap and they would get the sort of bedroom bedroom. And so I think that people just become, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Creative. People just have to become creative and figure out how to keep their rents low um, and still get by. So I kind of looked at the example of my New York friends as to, you know, how they made it work. And oddly enough, now they actually own real estate in New York. So I feel like it is kind of possible. And I think that when you're younger, you just sort of make different sacrifices, right? I think that's why so many young people are just living at home. They're not leaving. Yeah. I mean, also the rental demand is up because people can't afford to buy in this city. Right. And so what we're seeing is that uh, more people are buying or sorry, are renting larger homes uh, with two or three bedrooms and then kind of, you know, sparsing them out, renting out each room. And then collectively you can afford to live in, you know, a larger home uh, than maybe a little condo. But what does that hmm. say? I know we always circle back to this, but what does that say just about the livability, the affordability of the city? Yes, I know Toronto is an amazing city. I know there's a <laughs> lot of great things and great amenities, but it gets to the point where it's like, if I if I can't even afford to rent in this city, then people are just looking other in other places. And that's a reality. People are looking at surrounding areas outside of the city. They would... They will for sure. But I guess we also have to keep in mind, not everybody wants to own. Some people want to rent. Yeah. Some people have no intention of of owning and they would much rather rent than own. And I think that every time we sort of frame these conversations, it's around that ex- every single person wants to buy. That's true. Not everybody That's does true. and not everybody can afford to. And also too, I mean, I think we have to change our frame of mind about the percentage of people who are going to own versus those who are going to rent because it's just not going to be as high as it was in the past. Yeah. And I think some people have just resigned themselves to the fact that they won't own. And so yeah. you know, it's kind of settling into uh, renting. Okay. Another headline from this week, uh, TD bank has filed a lawsuit against a Toronto area home builder due to what they claim are a series of bad checks. Can you tell us a little mm-hmm. bit more about this story? This is just fascinating. It is fascinating, actually, because I started reading it like through a tweet on Reddit yeah. earlier on like Monday. And I was like, what? So it's this company, State View Homes. They are a, a York region builder, uh, predominantly pre-construction houses versus condos. And so, yes, this week, TD Bank found that there was a check kiting fraud. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the heck is check kiting? I've never heard of this term before. So essentially what they've said, what they've, what they allege has happened Mm -hmm. is that the state view homes had various accounts at RBC and they wrote checks in various names, whether it was employee names, fake family member names to TD bank to deposit in their account here, here at TD bank. Mm -hmm. And then apparently what happened was before the, t- the checks actually cleared through TD Bank, somebody went and got the cash out. Yeah. And then they canceled the original checks. And so I guess my question is, like, for anybody else out there, myself included, if I've ever tried to go and get money out of the bank before the check is cleared, it's like a non-starter. Mm. It's like a fault. So I'm like, how in the world did people get money out of their account 
before the check has actually cleared because banks are pretty tight lipped about that stuff. So I feel like there has to have been like an insider there working because how else could you take out to the tune of $37 million? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know. If, I, I don't know if there's an insider. And all of this is are all allegations that have to be proven in court. We will say legally. Um, yeah. But but I also wonder too. Like I wonder, you know, as you grow as a company, if there's more leeway uh, as insurance that yeah, you can pull out more money. I I don't know. I've never run a multi million dollar uh, corporation or organization. But I wonder if there, you know, if you and I, you know, like if we tried to do that, obviously it won't work. It's a personal account. But I wonder yeah. if things are different for, you know, multi-million dollar organizations. What I, my question is, what happens to those who have purchased, you know, hundreds of these unbuilt townhouses by yes. this company? So this is the problem. So think back to Urban Corp a few years ago when uh, they declared bankruptcy and essentially what happens and they had some townhouses that are almost finished being built. It leaves people in the lurch Mm -hmm. because if your house or townhouse is almost finished being built, you can't get your deposit back, but there's nobody to actually finish getting your townhouse built. And so you get completely tied up in the bankruptcy proceedings. Most likely you'll end up having to fork out more money on your own just to get that townhouse completed, but it's still part of a corporation that needs to be registered. So it just becomes this quagmire. So, you know, the people who have bought places with this company, the ones who are places are close being close to built, they're kind of screwed. Um, people at the earlier stage, maybe, maybe not, they might get their deposits back. We just don't know. So Steve, because now, yep, go ahead. Now all the other lenders are also saying, give me my money back. Yeah. Meanwhile, when you sort of look at the, you know, the, the names of the people running the company, I mean, they live in some pretty stush houses, mm. like, you know, they're, they're living in like King city, Richmond Hill in like palatial residence is that are like well over $4 million. Wow. Well, yeah. Stateview has said that they are not declaring bankruptcy and they have relieved the company's CFO of all of his duties. That has right. been their statement so far. So, yeah, we will see what happens to that. Again, my heart goes out to those who are wondering, those who have you know put their deposit down for a new townhouse and are now wondering, will I ever move into that home? That is the big question for sure. Uh, Before we move on to some of our non-real estate stories, Devel, this one also caught our attention. More homeowners are underwater when it comes to their mortgage loans. Canadians uh, Mortgage and Housing Corp uh, found that those with a loan to to value ratio more than 95% has doubled to 2.8 or $5 billion. Can you explain this? So this is essentially those who have loans that uh, over, you know, mortgages on their homes that uh, equates to 95% of the actual um, uh, equity of their home, correct? Yes, that's correct. So CMHC basically charges a, a premium, provides and insu- requires insurance essentially for anyone with a down payment less than 20%. I find this headline very shocking because it says it's doubled. Yeah. But the number is 2.8%. Yeah. I know. It's <laughs> so, a small percentage. So when you say double, I'm like, so you've created a shocking headline, but 2.8% <laughs> isn't really that hi yeah um but yeah it's basically saying that there are people who are underwater with their mortgage meaning their mortgage is worth more than their house is worth Mm -hmm. but if you don't sell then you're not going to realize that so if they waited out a few more years it will be okay if people are making their mortgage payments they are going to be able to renew their mortgages it's not the same as with private lenders so it's a shocking headline, but I feel like, okay, let's <laughs> calm down. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it is a small percentage, but it is kind of reading the tea leaves, right? Like if more and more people feel like they have to take out m- more of a loan just to stay in their homes, again, what is that saying? And and I guess my question is, what is the way out of a scenario like that? You're right. I mean, you keep your home, but will you ever be able to pay off your mortgage if you're in that deep? Yeah, I do. I think that people will. I just think that it's a time thing. I think with real estate, 
it's not a quick, hey, look at me next year. It's a, let's look at you five years from now. And so those people, if they can just hang on, they, they will get out of this. I think it's the people who have private mor- mortgages with private lenders. Mm-hmm. They're really at risk because that's where we're seeing the power of sales in the market. It's the people with the private lenders. I think the people who have mortgages with banks, the banks are trying to work with them by extending their amortizations, by doing things like that so that they can stay in their home. So I think it's really just a matter of just wait it out. It's going to be okay. Okay. Let's move on to some uh, non-real estate headlines that caught our eye. Uh, An Air Canada passenger has filed a complaint when he was served by a flight attendant that didn't speak French. Um, And so he was in business class, asked if the flight attendant spoke French, uh, was subsequently told that uh, by the flight attendant that if he wasn't happy, he could deplane, leave the plane, but that this is her area. And no, she does not speak French. Uh, I just there are so many opinions. What are your thoughts on this one? Well, I think it's a bit much. I mean, from this guy's who? from the guy or the, the flight the attendant? Okay. Sorry, from the guy. I'm like, okay, you're flying from Quebec to Florida. So you're going to an English speaking country. So, you know, although there's so many Quebecers in, in Florida, he probably has lots of people that speak French there too. But as an aside, we know that there are challenges right now, getting workers, people might be sick, et cetera, et cetera. It is possible that there was somebody else scheduled to work who spoke French, who maybe called in sick. And the alternative was that Air Canada might have had to cancel the flight entirely. Or they said, you know what? Let's just get that English speaking flight attendant and carry on with everybody's day. (laughs) I have a totally different opinion on this. Well, first of all, Air Canada has said that on the flight in question, there were two out of three crew members on the flight that were bilingual. Yeah. So so there was the ability to bring somebody to him and speak French to him. I think I think he was trying to push his luck here. He is bilingual. He does speak English. Because as I was reading this article, I was like, how are we getting this information if he doesn't understand English? Well, he does understand and speak English. Um, He subsequently went on. He stayed on the flight. He was told twice by the flight attendant as well as uh, the gate attendant that if he wanted to he could leave but the the plane was moving on um and so he subsequently decided that he every time he was spoken to by the flight attendant he would respond in french i think air canada is a canadian airline we are a bilingual speaking country we have two official languages in this country even if it's really bad French, which I have heard on many, many, many a flight, uh, I think the the attempt to try to communicate with somebody, let's say he didn't speak uh, English, he only spoke French. I think that is the right and should be the expectation of customers specifically going on a Canadian airline to expect that somebody would be able to help in a different in French specifically. And I feel like we need to be a little bit more forgiving and we need to get over ourselves. I mean, maybe it's not politically correct to talk about the language thing, but, you know, if we look at the largest languages spoken in the world, I believe the number two on the list is Mandarin. I think that number three is Spanish. So in my mind, I'm like, we need to broaden our horizons when it comes to languages. (laughs) Well, he has complained to the Quebec office of the French language um, after the flight. He doesn't trust uh, complaining directly to Air Canada because he doesn't think they will handle the situation. Um, And so he has directly um, complained to basically the language police uh, in Quebec. We'll see what happens uh, on that case. Fascinating on both sides um, on that one. Okay, another story that caught our eyes. you know, we've all been scratching our heads on this one. Uh, found out this week that the LRT is, hey, surprise, surprise, still not ready. Uh, cool. Or, or you know, we're not taking a trip on it anytime soon. Uh, your thoughts on this? Okay, so I live at Young and Eglinton. <laughs> so I got a lot of thoughts about yeah. this. This project started in 2011. Mm-hmm. It is 2023 right now, and they have no idea when it's going to be complete. And nobody is talking about it. 
right? The Ford government will say nothing. Metrolinx, who's building it, will say nothing. In fact, I believe I heard there was some sort of Ford memo, Ford memo that told Metrolinx to be tight-lipped about this. Yep. And for people like myself who live close to, you know, Eglinton, Lawrence, Davisville stations, all, all of Eglinton, of course, but those young stations, you know, for many, many weekends on the um, over the last couple of years, we don't have a subway. Mm. We have to take a bus to get to St. Clair Station in order to get downtown because they're always doing track work, which is related to this LRT. Yeah, And so, I mean, maybe I sound like a whiner, I don't know, but I don't want to take the bus down to St. Clair. I want to take the subway. And, you know, it's unbelievable all the businesses that have been affected by all the construction along Eglinton for so many years. I mean, there's businesses that have had to close or downsize simply because their patrons can't park and there's nowhere to go. So, you know, I'm so disappointed that it takes transit so difficult, so much time to get built in the city. You know, what's going to happen when they start building the Ontario line? How yeah. long, you know, they've just announced that Queen Street's going to be closed for the next four years. Is it going to be four or is it going to be 10? Like, come on. I think that is the concern of everyone. We're going to have uh, a, a small business owner on the show later on who is located on Eglinton as well and who has, uh, yeah, really struggled to keep her business open. Uh, you're right, Devel. I mean, it has been a headache for many people down there or even those of us who want to get to that area or that part of the city. I know of many people who just try to avoid it. And because of that, businesses have been impacted. I mean, I want to applaud the media this week because, you know, including uh, the great shows on this station for really holding uh, the Minister of Transportation accountable this week. And uh, at a press conference earlier this week saying to uh, Minister Mulroney, what is happening? There was the announcement of the Young Street extension, which is great. And we'll talk about that. But yeah, we're still sitting here 12 years later waiting for this crosstown LRT to be finalized and what we have finally heard and I think that's also attribute, attributed to the Toronto Star's excellent work in their investigative uh, reporting found out that um, uh, a lot of this work has been halted because there have been problems with the work that has been done and now yeah. they are redoing Work. Yeah. So can you imagine, Devel? I mean, yeah. you think about the 12 years that you and your neighbors have had to suffer and get on a bus and shuttle and all of those things just to get throughout the city. And then to find out that this is going to be delayed maybe until the end of the year, maybe until next year because of It'll mistakes, be because of mistakes yeah. that have been made that now have to be redone. Yeah, because I think I heard, I believe it's the Sloan Station along yep. Eglinton. Yeah. They're basically redoing yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, it's it's just one of those things you just shake your head, you know, especially if you travel around the world. And people say this all the time. When you look at transit around the world, it's so much better. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Bangkok, Thailand a few years ago and hearing that they built like an over the rail subway system very quickly. And I thought, why can't a place like Bangkok do that so fast? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many years later, we're sitting here with an unbuilt system. Yeah. And I think the thing is we have to run, but I think the the reoccurring issue we find, even with snow removal in this city, yeah. and then now we have have this issue, you know, ongoing issue with the LRT, is the fact that we keep hiring these companies that can't do the job properly. And so why do yeah. we keep ha hiring these contractors that somebody then has to come behind them and fix the work? Mm -hmm. There's obviously... Mm -hmm. A problem here that needs to be fixed and give yeah. us a deadline give us give them a deadline and then tell us what the deadline is and let's have the ribbon cutting ceremony and let's get on our way and let's <laughs> stick to the deadline exactly thanks so much Devel. great thanks for having me